is Matthew Wayne Selznick. And this is Sonatotem, episode 82. Hello, my friends. On this and every episode of Sonnet Totem, we talk about making stuff, finding success as we each define it for ourselves, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Who am I to be talking to you about such things? Well, I've been a DIY independent creator, a self-published author, a musician, a podcaster for 25 years, give or take, depending on how you do the math, even longer if you want to uh, take us out of the internet realm and into the real world of publishing zines and newsletters and things like that. I try to approach everything I do from the perspective of an experienced beginner. As I've said in the past, it's not my first rodeo, but they keep changing the horses and the bulls and, and the clowns too. So there's always something new to learn. I try to share those things with you every other episode. On the other episodes, when it's not just you and me talking, I present a conversation with another creator, usually a writer of some kind. If you want to go back to Sonatotum 81, you can hear my conversation with Anthony Eichenlaub, the science fiction and fantasy and thriller author. You can find that conversation at mattselznick.com slash sonatotem-081. But every other episode when I'm not talking to somebody else, I'm just talking to you, my friends, and covering something that falls under the umbrella of making stuff, usually writing, finding success, and staying healthy and sane. This time around... I would like to explore the way my dreams have been hitting me over the head lately, and not for the first time, with things they're trying to tell me, things that I'm trying to tell myself. And um, as usual, I, I'm, I'm hoping that my experience, my thoughts on such things will resonate with you and have value for you. Maybe this is something you can relate to. So I have had not a literal recurring dream, not the same dream over and over and over again, but rather a recurring dream motif, a theme, sort of telling the same story in slightly different ways. But all of the archetypes are always sort of there. And this has been going on with me for so many decades <laughs> that I, I I call them my lost apartment dreams. And here's how it usually goes. In the dream, I, through one means or another, I suddenly discover or I realize or I remember that in the most extreme case, I have an apartment that I've forgotten that there's a place where apparently I'm still paying rent or haven't paid rent, but nobody's caught on or I don't know what, but I don't live there anymore, but I still have a key. A lot of my stuff is still there. Sometimes pets are still there and mail sometimes has, has stacked up in the mailbox and I always feel this sense of mild panic, like, oh no, I, how, how am I, what, why, how did this happen? What am I supposed to do? Uh, do I still live here? Do I live here again? It's a lost apartment. A variation on the lost apartment dream is just a lost room. And this is actually how the lost apartment motif began. My earliest recollection of a lost apartment dream was actually a lost room. I realized that there was a small little narrow room in the apartment where I lived where 
I mean, I can picture it. Um, it's a long, narrow room, no windows, one door coming from the living room of the, the main apartment. And inside there is furniture that I no longer have. In particular, this double-level, mid-century, blonde wood with metal uh, accents end table that I really loved. But as far as I know, an ex-girlfriend from the, the late 80s got that or still has it. Who knows? We don't talk. <laughs> but, in, but the sense going into this room in the original Lost Room dream was that here was a bunch of stuff like books and artifacts, basically. Some of them directly connected to things that I really did have in my real world life. Other things just representative of lost stuff, magazines or pictures or bric-a-brac, you know? All this stuff was in this lost room, very cozily lit, very inviting. And the sense in that lost room was one of melancholy and nostalgia and longing. Well, that, over the years evolved and expanded into the lost apartment, the full-fledged lost apartment dreams. And these lost apartments almost always are places that I have never actually lived. One of them that has reoccurred several times, the actual setting, is a great big sort of uh, split-level semi-industrial place. Uh, I remember one section of this apartment was almost like a big open area could have been a basement could have been a loft but it had a garage door like a big wide garage door that uh spooled up and revealed like a big patio and a big uh expanse uh, like a view very semi-industrial sort of vibe, like a loft or something like that. But there were also all these other rooms in that particular lost apartment. And then the roof of that lost apartment was set up like an outdoor patio. Well, like all patios, right? But like a big sort of like an outdoor room with tables and chairs and, and lights that are strung across and even like ways to get to other nearby roofs like like everybody in this block had sort of connected all their roofs with bridges and whatnot and other times like one time it was an actual place where i had lived a, a small studio apartment i had in long beach in the uh mid 90s uh long beach california but while it was more or less my studio apartment on the inside on the outside it was this much larger big apartment building with a big courtyard in the middle. The details don't matter. The point is, is that most times I either discover things in there that I no longer own or people that I'm no longer associated with, or um, sometimes I'm just alone there trying to figure out, do other people live here? It's most of my stuff, but I see other people's stuff too sometimes. And when I do interact with the people from my past, uh, very often people I've been in romantic relationships with, but not always, there's a sense that either time has passed, but things are still similar between us or heading back that way, or um, in the case of these romantic relationships, or in the case of other people, oftentimes it's old roommates that I've had. And they're usually disappointed to see me as if, oh man, he found out, he remembered that he, he still lives here. Crap. <laughs> and I want to talk about the lost apartment. And yeah, it does have something to do with the healthy and sane part of, <laughs> of Sonatotum's focus. Because the latest lost apartment dream that I had, just a few, few days back, I was... Okay, so the lost apartment was not a place I'd ever lived, but rather similar to a place I used to live with uh, a guy I was in a band with and our other roommate who I was not in the band with. 
And this was, uh, this living situation was uh, um, the very, very, very late 80s, early 90s, like 89 to, to 90, 91, something like that, right? And um, it ended poorly. Uh, I went on a little road trip. And when I came back, uh, the guy I was in a band with, uh, he moved everybody out. And he moved, we, we, we had a practice space in the garage and he moved everything out of that. And so I came back from this two week sort of uh, walkabout across the American Southwest and discovered that no one else lived there anymore. Now, remember, this is the days before cell phones and everything. This is, you know, 1991, 1990, something like that. And um, so, yeah, I mean, he and I, uh, we are very neutral to each other these days. I haven't seen him in person in uh, decades, and that's just fine. <laughs> um, we cross paths on social media every once in a while because we have mutual friends and mutual history. But anyway, point is, this latest lost apartment dream was sort of kind of that place. And I went into it after having a conversation, by the way, with an ex-girlfriend who, uh, same kind of deal. Like they represented this sort of like almost matter of fact, like, so, you know, are we still going to do something or are we going to be something or not? After that conversation, I go to this lost apartment and it's the same thing. It's like, okay, well, I haven't been here in a long time, but I clearly still have a presence here. No one else is in the apartment right now, but oh, look, there's the room and not the literal room from real life, but there's the room where I, you know, that's my room in the living room. There's my, I don't know, couch, my TV, whatever, but there are these other bedrooms where clearly other people live and there's a bunch of crap, uh, uh, from all these other people kind of encroaching on whatever my space there might have been because probably, hey, let's face it, I haven't been there for some unmentioned amount of time because it's a lost apartment. Also in the apartment is my dog, the last dog I owned, Kiyoki. And you can, uh, I, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode, Sonatotum episode 82, to a blog post about uh, Kiyoki that I wrote shortly after he died, but he's been dead a decade, right? But apparently he's been in this lost apartment. Somebody's been taking care of him. Um, and he sees me and he acts pretty much like it hasn't been all that long. The different thing about this particular lost apartment dream is in the living room, draped over the couch, is what I come to realize is a mop, like a, you know, those mops that have sort of ropey, ropey strands at the end. So not a sponge mop, but, but more of a ropey mop. It's, it's kind of set hanging over the top of this couch, very close to an Afghan that my grandmother had crocheted me, uh, when I was a very small child, which I still have, but covering the head of this mop is and pardon me, this gets a little, little graphic and a little disgusting, is very thick, caked on human shit. Just like, like, like each strand has a thick, like, like a uh, paper towel roll, thick coating of shit. And it's kind of everywhere and it's kind of going to get everywhere. And for some reason, I take it upon myself to clean this up. Because uh, it's my couch and it's my grandmother's afghan. And I'm literally getting shit all over me uh, as I'm trying to clean this up. I don't know why I didn't just take the mop outside, but it was in the dream logic. I had to clean it right there in the lost apartment. Um, and then, yeah, this ex-bandmate, ex-roommate shows up and he's like, oh, hey, because he didn't expect to see me there because it's a lost apartment. I haven't been there in who knows how long, right? So that was basically the dream. And it had all the elements of a usual lost apartment dream. Encounter with someone I used to be in a relationship with who uh, discusses with me uh, in a very sort of nonchalant way whether or not we are continuing or resuming our relationship and missing 
or lost or long since given away or sold or whatever items that had belonged to me. And the presence of other people living there, but not necessarily there. And someone that I used to live with making an appearance and being disappointed or disgusted that I was back. And my dog, sometimes it's cats, but this time it was my dog uh, who's been there all along. And, and, And this time, this artifact of symbolism, this mop covered with shit very near to things that I love and cherish. And I woke up from that one, that lost apartment dream, which was, I don't know, two or three days ago, maybe. And I just kind of laid in bed for a little bit and let that, let it process. And the reason, 20 minutes in, the reason that I'm talking to you about this in this episode of Sauna Totem is because laying awake that morning, I realized that my subconscious, I mean, the lost apartment dreams are always indicators of frustration or stagnation or, or some sort of block in my life, some sort of yearning that is not being satisfied, right? But this time, it struck me that it's my subconscious kind of dealing with this long dry spell that I'm in. And more importantly, the feeling that I can't get to a place where I can create. And, you know, if you really want to analyze the dream, you know, I can't get to the literal place where my memory lives. Because I think memory is integral to imagination. I think, uh, Uh, feeling a sense of comfort and familiarity with one's own mind, with one's own memory palace, which I think really the lost apartments are probably very, very specific symbols of. And also the fact that personality is a product of memory. So I can't get to the part of myself that holds my creativity. I've forgotten that I live (laughs) or that I have a bunch of my stuff in this particular place. I've forgotten that I live in this lost apartment. I I realized that it really, what's going on is it's my subconscious telling me that this place is here, that it has both cherished things, valuable things, things that represent home and peace and contentment, but it is also literally soiled and inhabited by things that, uh, that fuck everything else up. And, you know, beyond kind of just being shown this, I don't really know exactly what to do with it. Because in my real life, I don't know how to unlock the door to that lost part of myself. Because there's always something, very real world concerns, that either have to do with me directly or, or involve me, that block my passage that prevent me from returning to the lost apartment, to that place in my head where I can create. And so these lost apartment dreams are like, hey, don't forget about this place. And we need you over here because you still have some stuff here. And, and oh yeah, that asshole still lives here. And for some reason, somebody put a big mop full of shit all over your property You know, (laughs) my subconscious is screaming at me to find a way back and I'm not sure how to do it because there's a lot in my life that's outside of my control that's keeping me. So 
whether connected to that or not connected to that, I'm not sure. But over the last few days, since that latest in a long, decades-long sequence of lost apartment dreams, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, like streamlining and simplifying and clearing the path of all the things that I am, that's in my power, that's in my resources, my, my store of ability to do. And also that uh, it's probably time to figure out a way to get some kind of professional guidance. We call that therapy, kids. I don't have a lot of disposable income and my uh, health insurance, like many people, my health insurance doesn't really cover a whole lot of uh, therapy. But I think it's time to, to, to find a place for that maybe twice a month. I don't know. But I, the, when these lost apartment dreams pop up, it really is my subconscious. I know this much. It's my subconscious screaming at me that, that things are way out of balance. And this time, finally, I think I'm going to try to get some assistance in working out how to return to that balance. And streamlining, unloading some things will probably be... Uh, you know, in part, that is so that I can financially afford to add some therapy to the mix. Because uh, I've been using these lost apartment dreams. I've been taking them as warnings and sort of yellow alerts for, as I said, decades. And more often than not, just being aware that the dream happened is enough to sort of steer me back. But... Uh, you know, the course is always, uh, uh, the course always shifts again and not too long. And this, this is, uh, this so-called dry spell, this, uh, what I referred to a few episodes back as, you know, the absorption part of the sponge cycle as always, there'll be a link in the show notes for that. Uh, it's just gone on too long and I'm going to be what? 56 in a couple of months clock is ticking memento mori right so the lost apartment maybe it's finally time i move my shit out of it right <laughs> clean up the shit that is in there and move my precious things out of it or fuck move in all together and uh <laughs> kick the rest of those assholes out of it <laughs> Kick the kick what ails me to the curb and uh, move back in full time to the place where I'm happiest. That place in my memory palace where I keep all my stuff so that I can share it with you. So that I can get back to creating, to making, to, to, to finding the space in the real world, in the waking world to do the things that will bring balance back to my life. I'm going to take a little break here for the uh, interstitial, which I hope you will listen to. And then, well, as they say, I'll be right back. Hey, if you've enjoyed this or any other episode of Sauna Totem, I've got three things that I would love for you to do for me to help show your support for the show. The first thing is, if you haven't already, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, please subscribe for free to Sauna Totem. Just click that subscribe button for Sauna Totem wherever it is that you might have heard this episode, wherever it is you get your podcasts. Next, wherever it is that you get your podcasts, I hope you'll take just a moment to rate and review Sauna Totem. Tell the world why you enjoy the show and why other people should listen to it and subscribe for free. And finally, if you'd like to go the extra mile and you have the will and the means, I hope you'll consider becoming a patron of Sauna Totem and my other creative endeavors. For just $5 a month, not only will you be a member of the Multiversalists community of writers and readers and creators, you will receive all kinds of 
special access, perks, and exclusive content, not least of which is the uncut, unproduced edition of every episode of Sonatotem. Just go to mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron or visit patreon.com slash mattselznick and pledge just $5 a month to support the show through your patronage. That's it. If you can do one or two or all three of those things, you'll be really helping the show and helping me reach more people with the Sonatotem mission of making stuff, finding success, and staying healthy and sane in the process. Thanks. I, I do have a question for all y'all um, to wrap everything up here. But uh, first, I want to take a moment to thank my Multiversalist member patrons. These are the folks who, month in, month out, pledge $5 to support Sonatotem and my creative endeavors as a whole. Thank you so much, once again, to Chuck Anderson, Amy Bowen, J.C. Hutchins, and Ted Leonhardt. I want to also thank Jennifer Sutton, who made a one-time donation via paypal.me slash Matt Selznick, which you can also do. And I want to thank, and I don't often thank her because she's not technically a multiversalist. She gives a much lower amount every month, but she does still contribute every month. I want to thank Zoe cohen Lay for her noted contribution every month. You see, folks, uh, technically, only the multiversalists, only the $5 a month patrons uh, get an official mention in every episode of Sonatotem, which, of course, you can, too, uh, as well as having yourself linked out from the show notes for every episode of Sonatotem during which your patronage is active. You heard all about it in the interstitial you can go to mattselznick.com slash b-a-patron to find out more. But every once in a while, I like to thank Zoe, too, because uh, she is sort of a, a silent contributor out there in the world. And uh, I appreciate it. I hope she's well. So, gang, when it comes to your creativity and your struggles, if you have them, with maintaining an active, creative life, what do your dreams tell you? Have you ever had your subconscious deliver as clear and obvious a message as the lost apartment dreams are for me? How did you interpret those dreams? How did you uh, take action based on what you believe those dreams were trying to tell you? I would love of course, and as always, to hear your feedback on this and anything else you hear on Sonatotem, you can go to mattselznick.com slash sonatotem-082, which has the full show notes for this episode. And at the bottom of that page, you'll find a place to comment. If you would rather email me your feedback, you can do so at matt at mattselznick.com. Dot com. If you'd like to record a brief voice message, which I'll play on the show and then respond in the show, you can send that voice message, maybe just record it on your phone or whatever. You can send that to matt at mattselznick.com. And by the way, I know Amy Bowen, I still have some comments and feedback that you sent in that I need to get to. And I realize there are a few of those that I keep putting off. But I know they're there, and I will uh, include them in a future episode. Not next episode, because Sonatotem 83 will feature a conversation with the author Jeffrey Doherty, who uh, I have known sort of on the interwebs for a very long time, and I was pleased as punch that he wanted to reach out and have one of our conversations. So that'll be in Sonatotem 83. And then... Sonatotem 84 will feature my thoughts and reflections on my time at the 2023 Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association Nebula Conference, which I'll be attending in Anaheim, California, 
from May 11th through May 14th. I'll be there at the hotel for the convention, for the conference. So if you are uh, planning to attend the Nebula conference, be sure to uh, reach out. I'd love to connect with listeners of Sonatotum uh, in person. If by chance you're at the Nebula conference, the Nebula conference is where the science fiction and fantasy writers association present the Nebula awards for outstanding examples of science fiction and fantasy in the media. That's just part of the weekend though. I'm going almost entirely without expectation. I haven't been to a conference or a convention since I want to say 2008 or 2009. And, uh, I'm not on any panels. I'm not selling books. I mean, let's face it. I'm going to have some books in my backpack. And if you want one, I will happily sell one to you. But I'm not going there to pimp or peddle or promote. I just want to kind of be there to ease my way back in and meet some people and hopefully uh, just soak it up and... uh, Who knows? Uh, Again, like I said, I'm trying not to have any expectations. I'm looking forward to being in that environment for three or four days. So by the time episode 84 rolls around on the 17th of May, I will have had that experience and I'll tell you all about it. (laughs) How... Have your dreams affected your creativity? How have your dreams safeguarded your creativity? Do you have something like the lost apartment or some other super obvious symbolic recurring thing that tells you what you need to hear now and again when it comes to your creative life? I'd like to hear about it. Meanwhile, my name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. Take care. Mm-hmm.